Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Center for Psychedelic Psychotherapy and Trauma Research's lecture series. Today, we're going to hear from Natalie Ginsberg about the potential role of psychedelics to help heal from trauma, including cultural, racial, and intergenerational. Natalie Ginsberg, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at MAPS, works to disentangle science from political partisanship to create safe, equitable, and regulated access to psychedelics. She's currently partnering with Israeli and Palestinian colleagues to develop a psychedelic peace building study. Today, she shares with us her experience in psychedelic policy and Dr. Rachel Yehuda brings her wisdom and expertise in the field of traumatic studies. We're also hoping to hear from each of you. We'll have 15 minutes at the end or so. Um, so please put your questions in the chat and we'll ask you if you're comfortable coming on camera so that we can all speak about it. We also hope to see you at 5.30 at our um, post lecture discussion on Zoom. Without further ado. Thank you um, very much, Lauren, for that introduction. And um, I'm delighted that you guys, I'm, I'm delighted that everybody here could join. And I'm so delighted in particular that Natalie Ginsburg is here with us. Um, I met Natalie a few years ago um, and was completely struck by her wisdom and compassion and energy um, for the work that she's doing that I think is gonna stand to benefit so many people, but most of all, her very original thinking about healing and about um, mental health and the use of psychedelics. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, we're gonna structure it as um, like a fireside chat because the work hasn't really evolved to the place where there could be like a formal uh, presentation the way that we heard last month from Rick Doblin, but it's really about hearing your thoughts, Natalie, and just really helping us understand um, in our progression of trying to understand how psychedelics can be used therapeutically, just helping us um, with some of your thoughts. So the main thing that I'll be asking you about in the next 45 minutes or so is your work in applying psychedelic medicine to intergenerational healing and healing from the effects of um, racism and injustice and something that I think we really care a lot about. And we're very interested um, in that topic here in our new center for psychedelic psychotherapy and trauma. And the discussion provides a great opportunity um, to go in some really important new directions. For example, you know, we can really examine the reach of psychedelics beyond traditional DSM-5 diagnoses like PTSD and depression. But also for our group, we wanna learn about um, the psychedelics that you're using for and get into the general concept of whether psychedelics can or should be used interchangeably or in different indications, um, even beyond diagnoses. And um, I know that we'll definitely be talking about ayahuasca today. So we're looking forward to having a conversation uh, between differences in ayahuasca and MDMA, which is the psychedelic we learned about last month from uh, Dr. Rick Doblin, who you know very well. But let's start by getting to know you a little bit. You now work for MAPS and how did you become interested in the healing potential of psychedelics and what particular aspects of this work are most compelling to you, Natalie? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the honor of being here. And I just have to say before I was lucky enough to meet you and, and spend time with you. you know, I had been really familiar with your research and always citing it and talking about it. So it's really such an honor to be here today talking to you about intergenerational trauma. Um, but the road that took me to MAPS, um, well, the, short, <laughs> the short version of it was that I was in social work school um, and I was, my field placement took me to being a guidance counselor at a middle school in the South Bronx. And I also worked at an alternative sentencing court for people arrested for prostitution. So I was working with really high trauma populations. Um, and I was immediately struck by two different, well, many things, but two of the things that really stood out to me where one was how our approach to therapy seems so focused on symptoms reduction. And I was you know, being told many of these things, there's no cure, like addiction, you have your whole life, but here's how we can work with people to manage it. And that was just kind of a hard thing for me to accept. And the other piece that really struck me 
was when I would attempt to kind of trace the source or the root of these traumas, you know, working especially with the populations I was working with, it became quite clear that the source was not just, I mean, of course, there were also individual traumas in the person's life, but, you know, my students in fifth grade were walking to school every day, having policemen throw them against the wall for no reason, just, you know, like the everyday experiences they were having made them hyper vigilant and made them have all of these qualities I was learning or, you know, PTSD symptoms. So I started to really question what was the source of, of trauma. And I mean, that's a very big question, but that kind of thought process led me to my interest in um, ending mass incarceration and ending the so-called war on drugs um, that was so based on racism and criminalization instead of science or health, public health. Um, and so those kind of two roads led me to MAPS because I was, I was reading about psychedelic research and something just kind of clicked. I hadn't really heard about it before, but I was like, what is this medicine that in three sessions it can be helping someone with what with illnesses we're calling intractable? Like they must be really addressing the root source of, of that trauma. So from there, I reached out to MAPS and luckily they needed some help on their policy work. So I founded the policy team almost seven years ago. Um, and today we're going to be talking about what most excites me in this space. So I'm really grateful for that, which is this broader context of trauma and the role that psychedelic medicine can play um, in healing this holistic, uh, in, a, in a holistic way. Well, that's very exciting. I mean, what I'm really hearing you say is that you're elevating the conversation around trauma that stems from social marginalization and injustice. That's not something that we traditionally do in um, psychiatry and psychology. So it actually is really novel and exciting. Um, so for people that are dealing with more traditional psychiatry, in a way, this is quite a stretch from using a psychedelic like MDMA for PTSD or psilocybin for depression in both cases. These are being tried for intractable treatment resistant approaches, um, or maybe it isn't. I mean, we're used to thinking about symptom reduction, as you said, or targeting a biological or chemical imbalance. Uh, even the idea of healing from a trauma that is untethered to PTSD or depression can be very provocative in a traditional psychiatric setting. So what, what are your thoughts about that? Mm -hmm for us traditional psychiatrists and psychologists and scientists. I'm so glad you asked this question because this really has been um, something that's been driving a lot of my work around like the kind of questions I've been asking of, of people because as I started watching, I was very lucky to get to watch videos um, of MAPS MDMA therapy sessions, which I know you've also gotten to see. And something that was striking to me, it was even for the participants who were um, experienced trauma in the military or experienced trauma that was easier for us to talk about in a kind of isolated incident, often in their session tapes, some of the first things to emerge would be traumas from early childhood or from some other context. So I started to really um, kind of dig into my understanding of PTSD in general being so tied to one or two um, traumatic incidences and kind of um, peeling back, you know, that often people who experience trauma earlier in life might have, you know, more of a ch chance of developing it later if they experience um, another event. And kind of those questions really got me thinking, frankly, to your work of, of intergenerational trauma as well. And what does it look like when trauma is passed down from our family, whether it's genetic or behavioral or the, in the mixture of two, um, and how that sets the groundwork for our development of PTSD later as we um, encounter other traumas. Um, and you mentioned the DSM, and I think that's a really important thing to to elevate as well, because of course, so much of the the, world, the therapy world is um, revolves around the DSM, and it can be you know very helpful for many people. I've had you know clients in the past say what what a relief it was you know to feel that they understand what's going on with them with their name and all of those things. Um, 
But of course, there's so much also not captured in the DSM. And I think a really important point that has emerged for me in my work was realizing that the DSM, um, you know, yes, it's been updated, but it really was created by mostly white folks and has a certain bias to it that way. Um, and I say, you know, there's one example that a researcher, Dr. Monica Williams, who's done a lot of work around demonstrating how trauma can manifest from racism, she gives the example of if you, you know, for, to a, a white person, a, poli a um, routine traffic stop with a police officer would not count as a, you know, high likelihood of a trauma event or criterion a event like that feeling, but a black person stopped by a police officer these days could have every re reason to fear for their life. And so how dramatically different that is and how the way that we approach um, diagnoses often misses um, kind of the broader experience of trauma. And so that, that trigger, that piece is something that I'm really fascinated by. Um, and yeah, and I believe that so many people today might not have um, a, something that neatly fits into a DSM diagnosis, um, but may still be operating from a place of a fear and reactivity um, in ways that is that are creating a society that actually like perpetuates trauma um, unintentionally, perhaps. So I think also a lot about this as healing as almost preventative measures in a very <laughs> big sense of preventing cycles of perpetuations of trauma if people are able to, to be acting from a, a more a space of more compassion and less fear. Yeah, so I mean, that's, I find it a very provocative idea, which I happen to agree with. Um, but it, but it is interesting in that we view um, trauma exposure mostly as kind of a vehicle towards symptoms and then the symptoms become the problem or the syndrome becomes the problem and not necessarily the experience. And what you're saying is that there are lots of ways to define traumatic experiences and that you need to have a cultural sensitivity to it. But you're also saying something else that you're, you're, you're really, um, you're really placing more of a premium on these experiences than we do now. I mean, when we meet a trauma survivor, we immediately ask about the questions of symptoms, whether they be PTSD symptoms or depression, depressive symptoms. And what I hear you saying is that the symptoms may not be the same as they may, they may, live in very different kinds of ways, but affect overall mental health, right? That's what I'm hearing. Absolutely. Um, and something that's been really exciting from the psychedelic research like body um, is seeing that how effective addressing that root cause can be for the symptoms, like the symptoms do disappear, you know, not all like in, as a process and certainly not any magic bullet. I don't want to <laughs> misspeak that way, but we're seeing tremendous reduction in all of these symptoms by addressing that route. So frankly, with or without the psychedelics, that approach to me feels really like that's what really resonates with me as kind of a philosophy. And of course, I also, you know, I know many folks listening, I'm sure do a beautiful work also with wisdom production. And I do think we need to have all of the tools in the toolbox, but just to understand um, that spectrum, I think is really key. Um, something else that I think is, is really interesting when we're talking about um, PTSD is the different, um, uh, we were talking about kind of different ways of experiencing PTSD. So I, I'm inspired to bring up this concept of moral injury in this context, um, which I, I, I was really struck again in the videos that so much of what seemed to sit, have such a hard time sitting with people was often things that they really regretted um, doing and, you know, in the military perpetuating violence for example, um, and that was really striking to me and really um, beautiful in some ways also that that is what is so hard for people to hold when they feel responsible for something. Um, and I I feel in, in my experience watching these videos and talking to people over these past seven years that psychedelic therapy has a really beautiful capacity to help um, with that, help process um, your past 
like kind of shame, guilt, release those feelings, allow you to reprocess them in ways that you can understand them within yourself and not be holding you down in that way. So I guess I, I, if I'm allowed to ask you a question, I'm really curious how you see moral injury um, impacting your work. And, and then I guess I'll also I'm curious, um, I think it was you that said this, but maybe not that that moral the rates of moral injury you saw or the way people were bringing it forward seemed quite different in your work in Israel and the U.S. or something. And I was really struck and curious by that. Well, I think you're right that moral injury is at the root of a lot of really intractable PTSD uh, because a lot of intractable PTSD has to do with the conflict. Um, there may be less conflict in a completely straightforward, I'm 100% victim and someone else is 100% perpetrator, or it might play out a little differently than when it's a complex interaction, um, or when there's stuff coming from the past. Um, so, you know, I think I like the conversation about moral injury, but I want to and we can come back to it, but I want I want to really stick with um, with something with what you're saying because just before we go into the study that you did, um, I can imagine that some people who are listening to this might be a little afraid that the kind of work of just looking at these kinds of experiences, particularly in the context of racism and intergenerational trauma maybe opening the door to drug abuse. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned the war on drugs, but I think that certainly in conservative institutions such as where we find ourselves, we're actually worried about this problem. Many of us have seen um, patients or research participants um, who really suffer as a result of trying to um, use drugs to um, feel differently or heal their wounds. So what would you say to a group of people who would entertain psychedelics for people that really um, last resort debilitating psychiatric conditions, but might stop short at being open to using it outside to solve issues outside of a diagnosis. Um, mm. You know, just, just asking. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really important question. Um, one thing that's worth repeating, though it's certainly not the answer to that, is that psychedelics in general are things that people do not take on a daily basis. And yes, there are things like microdoses or different things that exist, but in these experiences, unlike other substances that uh, might be easier to develop these kind of patterned habitual use with, something like ayahuasca, I mean, I'll be honest, I have met people who <laughs> drank maybe once a month or something like that, which is, you know, fairly frequent, but that's certainly not common. And, and the point is, it's it's really a, um, not generally an experience that you're seeking um, every day. Um, but, and, but, you know, I do think it is worth really being um, conscious and careful and really fully understanding the way you're using this, these substances, the container, the mindset you're in. Um, I think all of these things make a really big difference. Um, and, you know, whether you're in a medical context or as this, the study that we'll get into, but even in an ayahuasca ceremonial context, um, just the way you approach it with a group, with a set place, um, it feels a bit, I, I think it makes it a bit more difficult to um, develop a kind of addicting, addictive relationship with that way. Um, but I do want to just name that, you know, certainly anything <laughs> is possible. And that's why I think it's really important to keep the conversations going and checking in with people as they're using different medicines. Um, and I think it's just worth naming in the spectrum of, of these things. The, the, the one um, medicine that I have seen people um, use in different ways is ketamine. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of tremendous, I know Mount Sinai does some really amazing work um, around ketamine, but I think uh, uh, besides ketamine, I, the potential for um, misuse on that habitual level is not so high. Um, but I think 
you know, I guess I just feel the need to, to also say everything. I, I approach all substances with a, you know, caution and intention. And I think that's an important thing to, to be thinking about. Great. So let's talk a little more about intergenerational trauma and how you got the idea to do the study that you are working on with Imperial College in London and colleagues in the West Bank and in Israel. So um, obviously that's where I met you in Israel when you were just putting this together um, during the, um, I met you during um, MAPS training when Israeli and Palestinian therapists were getting together for training. So tell us a little bit about the study. Sure. So yes, I'm really excited um, to be a part of this work. Um, basically, we, well, Dr. Lior Roseman is the lead researcher on this study out of Imperial College. Um, and we're also partnering with Antoine Saka, who is a longtime Palestinian peace activist um, who worked at the Holy Land Trust. And the three of us had, had spent time together and kind of Oh, it, this question has emerged in many spaces that I've, I've been in. I really don't, can't take credit for this, but I've heard people joke, you know, what if, you know, why can't psychedelics, you know, cure the, uh, answer all our problems in the Middle East or do, like just make these kind of these silly statements, but that we've kind of were like, wait, what if there is something, you know, to draw out of these, why does everyone make these offhanded comments? You know, they might be kind of joking, but what is, what is really there? Um, and as we started to have more serious thoughts and conversations about that, we actually discovered that there were a few groups of Palestinians and Israelis who were already sitting in ayahuasca ceremony together. So that was the, our study. We decided before we could you know, proceed with anything else, it was essential that we speak to people who are already um, having these kind of experiences in joint spaces and to really understand how those um, joint circles were impacting uh, people participating. So we ended up interviewing a few dozen participants um, who've sat in different ceremonies, both around Israel and Palestine and some ceremonies took place in Germany um, and some even in Brazil. Um, there's, it was actually was a really beautiful process trying to learn and trace um, the communities that already were existing. Like there was this one group that would travel to Brazil, you know, and, 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 and collect both Israelis and Palestinians. Um, something really important to note is that the, all of the people participating, they did not join to like solve the, the Middle East conflict. They were simply joining for their own self-work. Um, and I think this is, goes back also to the DSM question where in these ayahuasca ceremonies, there's really a range of people. Some people come who do have D DSM diagnosis, really severe things they've been working on for a long time and have tremendous healing in these spaces. And other people do not have any diagnosis and come from spiritual growth, exploration, exploration and just wanting to do self-work um, in, in a different kind of way. Um, but it's important to note that because we are developing um, also a more a study where we are inviting people with the express intention of peace building. And as you might have learned in these psychedelic conversations, as with everything, your intention makes a huge difference. So we just in our interviews, which you know I'm happy to get into more, the the premise really for most people was this own self healing work, and it was almost incidental um, initially that the other uh, the other people were there um, though again I'll actually caveat that by saying that it's quite different for Palestinian Israelis than Jewish Israelis because um, Palestinian Israelis and Palestinians without Israeli citizenship um, both did not have very many opportunities to drink. So this was really one of their, like there's just the only opportunity they connected with happened to be with Israelis. Um, meanwhile, ayahuasca is actually fairly common among Jewish Israelis re relative um, to, to other countries. So there was probably more of a choice as for Jewish Israelis to say, actually this, this mixed space seems interesting. 
but so that's that was setting the container. Um, but I'm realizing, Rachel, maybe should should I speak a bit about what an ayahuasca ceremony even is? Yeah, that, or that's like? going to be my next question. But first, I was going to reassure this group that these are IRB approved studies through Imperial College in London that we seek to um, when you're going to be setting up the ceremonies, they're going to be legal yeah. in the place that you're setting them up and that um, just want to make sure everybody understands that we are talking about, um, you know, it, use of ayahuasca in a ceremonial context, which is why you are referring to them as ceremonies. So maybe you can tell us about ayahuasca and also tell us about the ceremonial aspect, because I'm sure that that's on people's mind. And then, of course, I will follow up by talk, asking you a little bit about the pharmacology and how it differs from MDMA. But having gotten that out of the way that we are talking about a legal IRB approved study, um, tell us a little bit about what it means to drink ayahuasca, especially ceremony, because that might not be something everyone's familiar with. Sure. Yes. Thanks for <laughs> clarifying that. We do have all IRB approval for our both interviews. And the one that we're conducting was in Spain where um, substances are decriminalized. Um, but yeah, a little bit about ayahuasca, um, maybe just to totally step back for a second. Um, it is an Amazonian tea that um, different indigenous communities around the Amazon basin in Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador um, use in traditional ceremony. Um, it's a combination of different plants and contains the molecule DMT. Um, aya, the, the word aya means like corpse or dead body and wasca means rope. So it's known actually as the vine of the dead, um, which maybe in our context sounds a little um, dark, which, you know, it certainly can be, but there's really a beauty to it that people have a lot of experiences, um, maybe seeing um, relatives who have passed or like kind of feeling connected to the dead in that, that way, um, which is, you know, I'll get into later has been a really interesting part of ayahuasca in, in the, con the conflict resolution context. Um, but ceremonies, um, are usually held in circles um, and you know there's range of, of number of people to be involved but probably on average maybe around 10 to 20 people um, they often are kind of lying down I mean there's many variations of the ceremony but just kind of a, a like on a class a standard <laughs> example would be that um, and it's a multi-hour process where the person leading um, who's the ayahuasquero or the shaman um, sings many different songs called Icaros and and leads the ceremony but most people even though it's a group experience people are really having their own processes and are often kind of encouraged to stay in their space so you know I know many of you learned about MDMA therapy last week, you know, and I work at MAPS and I'm familiar with that. And I see this as like the part where people are asked to go inside with, an, you know, a the therapist and they usually it's an individual and two therapists and they're asked to go inside. But in an ayahuasca ceremony, you're just in a group, but you still have your own space and and go inside in that way. Um, but a really big difference, which I think is really powerful, is that af at the end of the the journey, um, usually people have a sharing circle and a really big part is that community building and integration and, and way people share right after and kind of follow up. And it's quite common that these circles of community stay quite in touch with each other. Um, so I see that support net network as a really essential part of that whole process. And certainly with the people we were interviewing, um, that community and support network was really integral to them, um, to their processes and building trust with the other people they were sitting with. So ayahuasca and MD it is like MDMA in that it promotes an inner process, uh, but it might be a little different than MDMA in actually um, promoting a more radical altered state of consciousness. Is that what you're also saying? 
I would definitely say that. Like, I would say way more people would report seeing visuals from ayahuasca than from MDMA. Um, and I can, I'm gonna, I'll go on a bit and talk about the differences, but it's also important to note that like everyone has really different experiences with different medicines. So while ayahuasca, many people have vision, some people don't at all and have very subtle experiences. So um, that's something that I know some of my friends who are doctors or who have more experience with more standardized medicine are always <laughs> kind of struggling with like, how does this, you know, it works so differently in that way. Um, but yes, ayahuasca, there's both more um, vision and also you can be kind of transported to another space in a different way that I've seen in, my, in the MDMA sessions. People, while in one sense, you're certainly in a very different heart space and your you know, amygdala is less reactive. So you're really able to be in a different space. You're still like pretty there, like especially when your eyes are open, you're, you don't feel like you're di really disconnected from um, that space. And I don't, well, I would actually don't want to use the word disconnection with ayahuasca, but you certainly feel like in a very, you know, can, can be transported to another world in that it's sense. Like ego dissolution. <laughs> yeah, that definitely, exactly. That's something that happens to some people that some with their experience with ayahuasca, their, um, I, this, the, this concept of visualization keeps coming up to me, I think, because um, it's, it's ayahuasca work seems to work in really beautiful metaphor ways. And, and I, I really like the stories I hear from people of a certain vision that was, you know, a metaphor for something so powerful in their life. I mean, but MDMA also does that too. Well, but, but unlike MDMA, um, it should be pointed out that ayahuasca actually acts on the visual cortex. Mm. And so it's kind of, it, it does make it different from MDMA, which does not have those properties. Um, so as we're learning more on the neuroscience of these uh, psychedelics, I mean, that is definitely a very big distinction about whether something promotes more of the visual visions that people say that they do have the visions and the fractiles. But I think what I want to go next, we can come back to this certainly in the Q&A. Why don't you tell us, um, and I know that you have results, can you, can you share with us um, a bit about what happened when Israelis and Palestinians had this experience together and how, what, what that was like afterwards for them? Sure. Um, so first I will say that most of them had had multiple experiences, which is also really beautiful. But so some of these realizations I would say are from multiple sessions, not necessarily just one experience. Um, but overall there was Oh, uh, everyone, um, like one thing that was really powerfully described was this connection to the so-called other through language and song. Um, and in these ceremonies, something I didn't mention was that the leader would use Hebrew and Arabic prayers and songs interspersed with the Spanish Icaros. Um, and that was really um, commented on a lot by almost everyone we interviewed. And in a really striking way, like there was one Israeli woman who, you know, there's some really tragic stats that like a majority of Jewish Israelis when they hear Arabic spoken in a public space feel fear immediately. Um, and you know, that we can talk about intergenerational cultural trauma programmed in that way. But so this Jewish Israeli woman said, this language, the only language that I hate in the world, I heard singing to me in a ceremony full of love and light. And she just started crying, like it just, totally shook her and changed her experience. And there are actually a few interviewees who started learning Arabic afterward. Um, and similar stories um, of Palestinians hearing Hebrew in a way that resonated differently. There was a lot of beautiful descriptions of like the frequency of the language and the sound. Um, another thing that was quite striking was the, um, the there were, we were talking about visuals and people saw a lot of um, really striking images. Um, someone, they were drinking, one context, they were drinking in a house where Palestinians had been um, kicked out of and forced to leave decades earlier. And a, another Jewish participant recounted seeing what they felt were seeing the Palestinians being forced out 
their house. Like they saw that as part of the ceremony and that really um, got to them in that context. And they had, and something worth noting that many of these Jewish Israelis had drank ayahuasca in other contexts and had not had some of these same um, visuals. So it does seem this context made a, a difference. Um, there's an, and the other, uh, a Palestinian um, participant had a really interesting experience of having, visualizing being an Israeli soldier behind a gun, looking down the nose of a gun at a Palestinian person, like about to shoot. And their reaction to that, the Palestinian person said, and all I felt was so much compassion and sadness for this Israeli soldier, how horrible it must be to be in that position to be killing someone and how much that must mess them up for the rest of their life. And like, you know, that kind of that that context was just really striking hearing people recount those type of of experiences. Um, but I want to also, you know, though there was a lot of compassion, there are also people still very much understanding the structural things in place. I don't, you know, want it to be understood that people just said, oh, we're all good. Everyone loves everyone. You know, people still very much are aware of the realities. Um, and actually, there is one, I might actually read this quote where someone kind of speaks about that, this like spiritual um, awake experience they had, but then having to deal with the realities of, of going to a checkpoint. Um, um, well, basically, he was just like, you know, I I can't go to a checkpoint as a Palestinian man. I can't go to a checkpoint and say, I'm a spiritual light being, let me through, <laughs> you know? And so that contrast is something that was really powerful that emerged. Um, and I guess I'll I'll say one last piece. I'm just, there's, there's so many elements from these few dozen um, interviews, but something really striking was almost everyone really spoke about the need for inner peace before outer peace or like how interrelated the both components were and that they thought we would never be able to have peace and resolve conflict if individuals weren't able to do their own self-work and self-healing. And that is really like this fundamental premise that almost every single person we interviewed shared. Um, and so that is definitely a big part of our um, hypothesis moving forward around focusing, like creating a container for people to do individual work with this broader cultural context and hopefully in that way, um, be playing a role in stemming some cycles of violence. Well, that's, that's very beautiful. I got a ping from someone. I'm going to explain that drinking ayahuasca um, why it's called that is because it's actually like this thick tea that is brewed. It takes several days to make it. And this is from a very ancient tradition. Um, the Amazonians have been um, brewing this tea from bark for it's thought more than a thousand years. Um, there are also slightly different versions of ayahuasca in Mexico or in South America or in different regions. Um, so that's that's what that um, that's what that refers to, and I think um, that you've really given us a very a lot to think about. I, I think um, we've sort of been mixing together racism and intergenerational trauma and healing from that. But I think what I'd like to do now is open it up to see what um, any of the audiences. Um, what any what's on the mind of anyone from the audience because you've really given us a very different kind of model for using psychedelics you've introduced us to a new psychedelic and uh, there might be some things that people want to ask you about so I'm going to turn this over to Lauren to uh, moderate the uh, discussion feel free to ask anything you want to ask and thank you Thank you. Yeah, a lot to think about. Um, so the question and answer floor is open. If anyone wants to type in a chat, then we can invite you up for more conversation. In the meantime, if anyone up here has any questions or comments, I'd love to hear that too. Yeah, 
just give me a moment while I invite people to come up here uh, on screen. One thing I'm curious about that you brought up was uh, was the connection to, to language and song. Um, and I'm wondering, you drew the vision uh, element uh, you drew the parallel to the the visual cortex activation. I wonder if that's something shared across psychedelics, if that might be specific to, to ayahuasca, if you have any thoughts on that. Thanks for that question. And yeah, there's also a lot of interesting research on music and sound and how that impacts the psychedelic experience in general. Also, I know Imperial has done some work there and possibly others. So um, I, I, that some, the visual experience is something that is um, does exist with other psychedelics, but as Rachel, Dr. Yuda is saying, like MDMA might does not have that same impact, but there really are a range of psychedelics, and many of them do have visual and auditory um, connect deep connection. And and I'll even continue with that that music is really considered an absolutely essential part of ayahuasca ceremony, like there it creates the container. It helps people move through all different elements, like depending on the song, depending on the energy of the room. Um, and similar to MDMA therapy, music is really essential part of that process. So yeah, I'm glad you brought attention to that. And I think it's something that we don't think about so much in other therapy. I mean, of course we understand music, but the, the essential nature of it in psychedelic work has helped me understand music differently and other aspects of therapy and healing. I'm wondering, I'm wondering just um, what is offered by ayahuasca that would be absent, um, let's say with another psychedelic um, or with just the ceremony um, and this kind of healing two different kinds of races, communities, ethnicities, um, has a control been done? Another great question. Oh, yeah, um, I, I'm gonna try that one because I wanna bring in the fact that um, uh, ayahuasca is also really being sought out by veterans who are doing a lot of traveling to places where ayahuasca is legal. Um, and there has been a movie recently made called From Shock to Awe that really describes um, the journey from veterans. And what happens is that by doing this together, um, even though you're in your separate space, by having the shaman or the director kind of unite the experience, you're having at once a communal and individual experience. Um, what you, you failed to mention about ayahuasca is that a lot of people throw up or lose control of their bowels. So there's a lot of purging going on. And I'm bringing this up because one of the veterans um, on the film said, it's, I'm purging out all that I don't want inside of me. I'm getting rid of all the anger and all the hate and all of the damage. And I'm just purging and purging and purging. So I think that that is um, just one aspect that is particularly true of ayahuasca that is not true of other psychedelics. Um, and so doing it as part of a ceremony when you're all in it together, um, normalizes it, reduces stigma and feels like a collective and shared process, even though it may be deeply personal, at least that is what I got from, from watching From Shock to Awe, I highly recommend it, um, available, I think on Netflix. Yeah, I wanna really reiterate that last point about this group work. And I mean, there's a, a number of differences, but ayahuasca in particular has this group component and especially when we're talking about cultural intergenerational trauma that's experienced by groups of people. I personally believe that group work is irreplaceable. Um, and I have to just shout out that I'm very excited that Dr. Yehuda is going to be leading an MDMA group study to try to understand how you might find some more intersections and more learning from these indigenous approaches to healing. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I want to circle back to the music theme 
And I was just wondering if there is any kind of way, not way, but if there is any data or maybe somebody studied, if there is a particular type of music. So clearly some of it is related to the rituals, but you know, music has a lot of idiosyncratic meaning based on person's preferences, education, whatever it might be. And of course we know that there is music that was created for psychedelic experiences, rock in the sixties and things like that. So I wonder if uh, there is anything specific, for instance, veterans, is that something that's related to the experience in the military and particular type of mm. music that was kind of consumed there? Just if you can tell, tell us a little bit more about that. I love this question. Um, and I'll first just wanna say the name of a researcher named Dr. Mendel Kalin. And he's done a lot of work over the past seven years um, understanding the role of music and psychedelic experience, doing neuroimaging, fMRI scans of how, of how music changes someone's experience under psychedelics versus without music. Um, so I think looking at his work would, would be helpful. But from my knowledge, we don't yet have the research that's like this specific kind of music is best for this thing. It's mostly, from my understanding, based anecdotally on therapists um, trying different things and kind of going with what they feel feels right. If someone is, you know, in the midst of working through something intense, maybe there's some music that like goes with that energy. Maybe if they're needing to just sit and like be relaxed, that's a very different tone. Um, but I know there is stuff written kind of speaking to this process and have, have therapists have spoken a lot about how they make those choices. Um, and it's something maybe some some people at Mount Sinai would want to research more about because I, I think it's really interesting. I don't know if Dr. Yehuda has more yeah, thoughts. Dr. called me Rachel. Um, the, Ilian, it's, um, there's something about music, as you know, because you're a musician, um, that is transportive and beyond words and activates different parts of the brain and it facilitates going into a different state of consciousness it's kind of um, provides a template that language usually does in the state of consciousness that we're in now what what language is to being in this state of consciousness music is to being in an altered state of consciousness and then when you're weaving in very traditional music that it, from the experience, uh, what a good facilitator does is really um, customizes the music. There is kind of generic music that is associated with different psychedelic journeying, but they'll also ask about, you know, what is meaningful music to you? Um, the, ru the, the rules are that generally the music doesn't have too much in the way of words that can interfere with, with um, the mood, except an exception is made to psalms or, or prayer music in ayahuasca ceremony, where a lot of times the words are sung in a different language and has this feeling of connecting to some other thing. It's definitely something to investigate, and it would be really interesting to do neuroimaging studies while people are taking psychedelics with and without the music. So I would think that's something if anyone is interested in, um, that, that probably could be arranged because it is such an integral part of, of, of the, I mean, can't imagine a ceremony where there's not music. And just to add to what you were just mentioning, I absolutely agree in terms of the experience. A lot has been written about neurocognition and almost like not cognitive enhancement, but like different styles of learning when people learn about music. And you don't have to be a musician actually to acquire some of these skills. And now we can overcome some of the challenges as you mentioned in neuroimaging. Actually, we're just starting an FNIR study. So there's technology now with wearables that could be incorporated in that and get this different aspect of is it the experience, if it's like, like you're learning something new and if that kind of opens new connectivity possibilities in the brain and we can do this in real life, almost like in a, in a session like this, people can sit in this office and have the brain signal kind of detected. So clearly something to think about. And I love that you're thinking like that because it gets us, the more we, think like this, the more we realize that understanding how psychedelics works 
is part pharmacology, but part under, really being able to understand the contribution of all these different kinds of elements that are introduced and their neurobiologic effect. So thank you very much for that. Definitely. For the content. So much of a culture and experience, the, the psychedelic is just one component of the experience. And yeah, I really think that's an important thing that a lot of folks have some difficulty wrapping their mind <laughs> around sometimes because so often our medicine is just like, here is the medicine, here's the pill. That's that's it. But very different with this. Um, hi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Great. Um, uh, so I guess my question is um, about um, the participants who were who were in the study. I'm just curious about how many people, um, like how they were chosen. Um, I mean, it's just interesting. I've spent a lot of time. I've spent a good amount of time actually living in Palestine, and I've spent some time in Israel as well. And I just, uh, given I guess my experiences there, uh, Pal you know, Palestine does have a pretty it, cultures are, you know, there's a, there's a lot of like conservatism. So it's very interesting thinking about like culturally a lot of Palestinians um, taking part in ayahuasca, <laughs> in ayahuasca um, study, right? So I'm kind of interested in how these people were chosen for the study, what the exclusion exclusion criteria were, um, and how it was generally uh, how it was, whether or not it was embraced. I mean, and also just thinking about a lot of people, you know, the study took place in Germany, right? I mean, a lot of Palestinians can't travel even to Jerusalem, can't leave the country at all. Um, you know, people in Gaza can't leave at all. So just how, um, and how you think that could have impacted any results. Thank you for that question, because there's a lot in there, and you're right that I didn't get a chance to really um, explain more clearly. Um, and first of all, I, one thing to bring up is that we that we didn't conduct the like the ceremonies themselves were already happening. The our our study was as an observational study, so we that we did you know of course choose people to interview, but that was based clearly on connection. It was a process of talking to people and being um, introduced. But it's really important to uh, to say that it absolutely was very like biased in that way, you know, it was one person to the next, it was a really um, self-selecting group who had the privilege and ability and knowledge and access to, to sit in these ceremonies. Um, the ceremonies, actually, some of them did take place um, in the land uh, in Israel or Palestine, and so our, we did, like, we interviewed after, we weren't at part of the ceremonies or anything like that. So that was, that was our part of the study. We are, I think I might have confused people because we're also doing a separate study that we are um, doing a whole process of interviewing people. Fly, we have money pledge or fun, flying people to Spain where it's legal or decriminalized to do that. So that's different. But what I was speaking about is just questions of people who had had their own experiences um, but I definitely want to mention that a big number of the Palestinian folks we interviewed were Christian um, and Christian Palestinians are a very small minority, like 2% of the Palestinian population and tend to have access to more resources and safety in other ways. So like even that really reflected that this was certainly not a totally representative um, sample size or anything of that sort. It was more to start understanding of what was happening in this space and, and to build from there. And yeah, I'd, I'd be also happy if you want to email me and talk more about your time there, because there's really a lot more to, to get into about the different dynamics that I didn't really have time to fully lay out, but there's a, a oh, lot to it. And, and I think it's worth also saying, if I didn't say clearly enough, that though we talk about it as a conflict, like with two sides or something, that it's really an asymmetric uh, conflict. And that's a really important thing to be considering as we're doing this piecework that, you know, th there are a lot of imbalances involved. So thank you for your question. Hi, 
how are you? I also had a question. Um, you briefly talked about the amygdala being um, the effect of ayahuasca on the amygdala. So I wanted to know, could you talk a little bit more about the neurobiology of ayahuasca? Yes. I was, when I mentioned that, I actually think it does, ayahuasca also affects the amygdala. I was saying I'm a little more familiar with MDMA that reduces the fear activation in the amygdala, but maybe Rachel has a few more. I know we were just talking before about this ayahuasca neurobiology. There are, there are very few studies that have been done um, and people are just starting to look at these things. Um, but what we, what we seem to know from the literature about ayahuasca is that its primary action is really um, against chronic low-grade inflammation and oxidative stress. It works on serotonin receptors, but also dopamine. Um, the dieta, part of the ceremony is that people actually go on a certain diet um, about a month before they take ayahuasca. It's recommended, which is a diet that reduces, um, uh, that is low in tyramine. Um, so I think that we, we're just starting to learn because there just hasn't been a lot of research on it. One of the things we're interested in pursuing in the center is how to use cell models and um, those kinds of things to really examine similarities and differences between psychedelics, just in terms of their properties on neural networks and gene expression. But then again, of course, you lose the other ceremonial aspects. But just to get a baseline on that would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, because of the effects of ayahuasca, the purging and all of that, it would be very challenging, I think, to do Im imaging studies with ayahuasca the way that people have been able to do them with psilocybin and MDMA, but I'm sure those are coming because there are a lot of centers now, and this is absolutely yeah. a good question. And, and I actually think there might be some research in Brazil around that, like I think um, Geralio, uh, yeah, there's, they're starting to do, and as you said, it's tricky <laughs> because ayahuasca is not the most lab friendly <laughs> kind of medicine, but they're starting that process. Great. So I guess, um, our time is drawing near Lauren, right? Is there one more question or should, or I think we should probably wrap up so everyone can get to their next. Or, yeah. well, we remind everybody that at five 30, is the um, hour we did that after Dr. Doblin's talk. It was really a lot of fun. So you can um, be sure to join us. I think Lauren can send out the link. Uh, we'll have an, more time to discuss this. What, what I was hoping to accomplish, I think we did accomplish. Thank you, Natalie, so much. Mm -hmm. I just want us to get a feel of the space and things that we that might not come to our attention because they're not in scientific journals, they're not talked about in our professional meetings. And the only way for them to come here is to really be introduced to the people that are thinking about really novel ways to think about these medicines. And so Natalie, thank you for giving us what it looks like in the beginning. <laughs> of an idea and uh, we'll be sure to follow your work with great interest and to all of you, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much. This is so much fun and such an honor. And yeah, I'm so happy to speak to all of you at the Mount Sinai Med School to say special connection because I was born at Mount Sinai and my sister-in-law is watching at Mount Sinai Med students. So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful.